Uh, in the absence of Simone, I'd like to thank you all for attending and particularly to Nigel, who's taken the trouble to prepare a most interesting discussion that I'm sure we'll find uh, of great value. And um, obviously, as, uh, as Alta says, you can all ask questions afterwards. But uh, thank you so much. It's over to you, Nigel. Okay. Um, perhaps just an introduction, how I actually started to um, get involved in the research for this book. I wrote an earlier book about the, um, about the Onda Bockefeld, which is an area around Liverville and uh, Calvinia. And um, I then thought of doing a, another book um, more on the uh, Rockefeld. So I was doing, doing some research in the Rockefeller area and looking at uh, loan farm records in the archives. And I found a lot of the uh, people who were living in the Onda Rockefeller also had a lot of farms much further to the east. Um, perhaps you know, do you know where the Onda Rockefeller is? It's, it's between Calvinia and Middleposs in the Northern Cape. So I was driving around uh, talking to farmers um, in this area where these, these easterly farms were. And I was wondering why they had these farms further in the east and thinking that perhaps they used it because it's in a different rainfall area. The Rockefeller is, is, is in a transitional area, whereas these farms further to the east were definitely in the summer rainfall area. So I was, I was just wondering why the people had these farms and talking to farmers. And I went to this one farm, Vogel uh, Streusfontein, you have to please excuse my Afrikaans accent. Um, and the guy was really nice, uh, Harry his name was, um, we got talking about it and he, he gave me some documentation about an inquiry um, into claims of certain natives at the mission station in Mandelboom. And he only gave me three pages and I had to go to the SA library to get the rest of it. And, and that just sent me off in a different direction of why they had this, why these natives were making these claims and um, so on and so forth. So, so now I can go through the things that, uh, that I researched. And the first one, what was the political, legal and social situation in, in 1847? And I'm talking obviously in the, in the Cape province, or wasn't in the Cape province, it's just the Cape. So at that time, the Cape was pleading for representative government uh, rather than being controlled from London. The, the, the colonial office in London would make really all the decisions for the colonies. In 1847, there were virtually no spare farms. Um, everything had been settled. People were settling further and further north. Uh, every year, the, the, the sons of a farmer wanted their own farm and, and the only farms available were further north. So, it was probably only in the top of Namaqualand where there, were, there weren't surveyed farms. And there was such pressure that any non-white people who'd, uh, who'd been granted a farm uh, were, being, were being pushed out. You know, people would make plans to, to get rid of them. And farmers from below the border were already trekking northwards um, to graze their herds after the summer rains. Uh, I'll go into that a bit further later. The, the farmers uh, did an analysis some years ago, sometimes had seven more, seven times more livestock than they could actually graze on their farm, seven times. So the only way they could exist with such vast herds was, was to trek. So in, in the winter, they would perhaps say, if they were living in, uh, in the Bockefeld Mountains, in the winter, they'd, they'd trek down into the Canaries Flactor, and in the summer, they would trek up into Bushmanland. The second thing is why had people moved out of the Cape uh, to the lands above the border? So this is a, this is a map uh, taken from uh, a guy, uh, Hendrik Jakob Rickard, and he, he, he ran away from the from the VOC, the Dutch East India Company, uh, and went and lived on the border. 
But there were big problems with the Dutch East India Company and, and the local inhabitants, uh, mostly because the, the Dutch East India Company wanted animals to, uh, to slaughter and use as um, food for the ships passing through. And a lot of the uh, local people didn't want to sell the animals and they were basically sometimes forced to sell the animals. So but they weren't very happy with the Dutch East India Company and a lot of people moved further and further away as the Dutch East India Company expanded or the, the colony expanded, the people would move further out uh, to get away from uh, having their livestock stolen. Um, a, a typical instance was um, a guy called Willem van Weyck um, one of the many, many infamous Fulham von Bakes in that time. Um, there, were, there were quite a few of them. Uh, he went on a cattle raiding expedition. He was living in the Sunfelt and he went on a cattle raiding expedition up into Mackerelland. And, and he stayed there quite a long time. In fact, so long that he actually went into a customary marriage with the daughter of one of the Namakwa chiefs. And um, and then after a while, they, they decided to leave. So, so they left and after they'd been like one and a half days travel south, they sent their servants back to go and steal the cattle of this Namakwa chief um, and bring them back to, uh, to the Cape. And of course, the Namakwas were quite cross about this. And they came down and, and complained to the um, Dutch East India Company, who said, yes, they, they, they understand that, that and the, they must give the cattle back. But then they changed their mind because they wanted the, um, the farmers on, on their side. Um, and that was the start of what they called the Bushman War of 1739, when there were large um, ex expeditions of um, commandos up into the Northern Cape to, uh, to, to fight the Namakwas. So that's, you know, there are many things that um, people wanted to get away from civilization. And then there was slavery. Um, you probably know that slavery was abolished in, in 1734, um, but any slave over the age of six had to work for another five years as an apprentice um, and get paid. Um, and then they were free, but you know, what were they free to do? Sometimes they could go to a mission station, sometimes uh, they, become, they could become vagrants, uh, they could get work on another farm. And, and a lot migrated north to get away from, um, from their previous owners. So that was a, a reason. And then the great, so-called Great Trek. Um, there's no real, as far as I can see, there's no, it's not a coincidence that the Great Trek happened in, in, in that time because that's the same time as slaves were released. And a lot of the, uh, the the farmers wanted to take their slaves with them. So, so they, by trekking north, the slaves had no idea that uh, sometimes that, that they were free. So that by trekking north over the border, they could take their servants with them. Um, there are various, various reasons people trekked. I remember reading one uh, guy who had beaten his uh, servant and he got fined five pounds and he was so cross being fined five pounds by a British magistrate that he packed his wagon up and trekked into, uh, uh, up into Natal. And commando duty. This is, this is the letter I found by mistake, well not by mistake, by accident, um, just filed in a, in a file in the archives. Um, I couldn't understand much of it, but I've got a friend of mine who's uh, Dutch to, to read it to me. And it's basically a letter from a, a barster um, called Samuel Rousseau uh, to the local uh, felt cornet uh, who's telling him that he must go on commando. Um, and he's writing to say that, yes, I understand you're telling me I have to go on commando, but my boss, who's uh, Jacobus van Rienen, uh, says I mustn't go. So, so what, what must I do? Uh, it's... Um, yeah, people were stuck in the middle. Interesting that this Samuel Rousseau is the only person I've ever met, uh, a pastor, who, who actually married a, a, a white wife. Um, I presume you all know who 
past us are. Um, in the latter part of the um, 18th and the early part of the 19th century, there was a vast disparity between men and women on the Northern Cape frontier. And men being men um, formed customary marriages with, with some of the Macrolades and their offspring um, was the nucleus of the Basta uh, community. And they always uh, took their father's uh, family name and they learned how to, to ride a horse. They were all um, staunch uh, Christians, uh, Dutch Reformed Church. Um, they could shoot uh, and do all those things, but they were not classed as the same as a, as a, as a white farmer. So they formed a, a sort of in-between class. And the other thing was, was military service. The, the, excuse the expression, but the top and top regiments, um, farm workers were forcibly conscripted. Um, so many from each farm were conscripted to go to the Eastern Cape to fight the Kosa. And um, they didn't have a choice. They were told they had to go. So many would say, well, I'm not going. And they'd just trek across the border. So, that's all the people that had moved uh, across the border. And why was the border moved? Well, because of this man, uh, Major General uh, Sir Harry Smith. His full name, Sir Henry George Wakelin Smith. He was a, a soldier. He fought in the Peninsular War with uh, Wellington against Napoleon. And that's where he met his wife. Uh, his wife was called a uh, Joanna Maria de los Dolores de Leon, um, and he brought her with him to South Africa. And that's why we have Harry Smith and Lady Smith named after the couple. He'd been here before, um, in between 1829 and 1835, he was the uh, Deputy Quartermaster General in charge of the troops during the 6th uh, cause of war and and he decided after they they won the war that he would annex a large uh, part of uh, the, what is now the trans sky um, for the British um, which he then did and he called it Queen Adelaide's province um, but when the news got back to uh, the colonial office uh, they were very cross at this. They said, we've got enough land, which is causing us enough problems without getting more. So they said, we must give it up. And they recalled uh, Harry Smith back to the UK. So here's the, the map of South Africa. Um, and when he came back in 1847, um, as the governor of, of um, Cape Province, uh, the first thing he did, I mean, he got off the ship, on a, I think on a Thursday, on a, on a Sunday, he sailed for, for the Eastern Cape um, because it was, the, it was the seventh cause of war, um, was in progress, and he went straight up to the Eastern Cape um, just in time for it to be um, completed, and he then re-annexed the piece of ground he'd annexed before, some years earlier, and also for no real definite reason, decided to move the border. You can see the area in pink, annexed by Sir Harry Smith, 17th of December, 1847. The border is at the bottom, which, which basically runs from sort of Springbok down to above uh, Levoville and Calvinia and, and across to the east, and he just annexed it um, by moving it right up to the orange. There are various suggestions, um, one of which was that uh, copper had been found up in the, in the northeast, and this was a way of getting access to the copper. Um, another one was it was just so complicated and so expensive to survey a whole border that it was easier just to move the border up to the orange, which is a, you know, a fixed position. So, how did the extension of the Cape affect those living in, above the border? Here's a, a map 
this is uh, Arrowsmith's map of uh, 1842. And you can see the border at the bottom before 18, in 1847, and then after 1847 at the top. It's an enormous piece of land. I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's a very large area of, of basically um, sandy felt. Some mountains at the bottom. Um, it's, it's not an easy place to live. So who was living there? Well, in, in the northeast was the, so northwest was the Nmakwa. Um, above the border, there were concentrations of, of pastors. Um, they were, as I said before, they were staunch Christians um, and missionaries from the Rannish Missionary Society had founded two missions, uh, one at the Mandelboom and one at Skidfontein, which are now, um, Mandelboom is now Williston, Skidfontein is now uh, in Alvin. So there were mission stations there and a large concentration of pastors living um, in that area, from that area further north, because the, the felt is so poor that you can't basically settle in one place, you have to follow, follow the grazing. There are also some, a lot of uh, Corsa, uh, further to the east. Uh, the Corsa had been moved into that area um, by the colonial government to form a buffer between, between the farmers and the, um, and the San, who, who were raiding south. Um, and then the Corso got moved north because the, the, the place they were given was, was quite good farmland uh, around the Pramberg, so they were pushed north above the border. And um, yeah, uh, and then basically also uh, a lot of Corso at the mission station in Skidfontein. And then, of course, all the way along the river were the Karana. And the Karana was a, um, a Makwa tribe. Lots of lots of the back of the tribes, the different tribes, but basically all uh, the same people, but uh, different chieftains and different names of their, of their groups. So this is the report I got um, from yeah, this is the report I got from from Harry Esterhazer, the first three pages. So he, he annexed this whole piece of land uh, in 1847 um, and he said that anyone who's already living there could, you know, on a farm could, could keep their farm. However, um, later it became obvious, um, later it became obvious that this could be especially the south part around the Kuriberg was actually quite Quite good land, and um, although the, after 1847 the, the uh, Afrikaans farmers uh, in the Northern Cape were, were trying to push the bastards and the other people off the farms and, and take the farms over, uh, subsequently the Reno farmers from the Eastern Cape uh, coming up via A place called Victoria West, coming up via Victoria West, uh, were also now trying to push the Boer farmers out um, so they could have these uh, big farms for, uh, for their merino sheep. And, then, and the, the Eastern Cape farmers had lots of money and they, they were quite clever in uh, arranging things to suit themselves. So the fact that Harry Smith said that these people could have, uh, that keep their farm, no matter if they were uh, ex slaves or bastards or, or whatever, all of a sudden it became a little bit difficult um, to keep the farm. They had to have special conditions in order to claim the farm. So, this report of an inquiry as to the claims of certain natives residing at blah 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 was to see who was going to claim the farm and and could they meet these new conditions? So, yeah, and, and the person who held it was, was, a, was a, a servant of, um, of some people in, uh, in Victoria West. So he was actually quite biased towards the Merino sheep farmers. His name was Orette. Um, the new conditions, if they wanted to claim the farm, 
One of them was, was continual and uninter uninterrupted residence since 1847. And this in a, in a in a country plagued by drought was, was really a difficult thing to do because you're, you, you have a farm, you're living on the farm, but all of a sudden um, there's no rain on your farm, but there's rain on, on farms 50 kilometers away. So you get up with your animals and you trek 50 kilometers so they can eat the grass. So that would automatically um, disallow you from claiming the farm. So lots of people didn't claim the farms. It was, uh, yeah, it was, a, big, it was a big problem. So this is uh, one of the diagrams of the farm at Mandelboom, which was, as I say now, Williston. That farm was occupied by the Rhenish Missionary Society. So that was given to them. And uh, there was half a dozen other farms where the people had a good enough claim to, to, to keep the farm. But mostly, uh, mostly they, they were basically forced out. This is a photograph I found in the Cape Times uh, from 1899. Uh, which shows you the village of uh, Williston. And uh, if you can see my mouse, that's the, the church that was built by the Rhenish Missionary Society, uh, or actually was, was built by the, the pastor community for the Rhenish Missionary Society. And if you ever go to Williston, that's now the museum. Thank you. And have to. Well, who's got their microphone on and is whispering? Anyway, so this is this is the this is the situation of, of the people. We have the, the Namakwa living in, in the top of Namakland, we have the Basta community above the border, we have the Kosa and the Kurana. So the Kosa um, they decided to, to leave and they, they migrated up towards towards Prisca. Uh, and, and started another community there, which of course was later um, pushed out again. Um, the bastards, they moved up into the western part of, of Bushman land and, and they split into, into two groups. One group under um, Dirk Philander. Uh, this is a painting uh, done of him, presumably from a photograph. Um, that group moved up into uh, the Kalahari um, and settled at a place called Mir, and another group um, under the guidance of uh, Hermanus van Wake uh, crossed the border into Southwest Africa and, and, and settled at Rehoboth. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Rehoboth, but that's still a bastard community there. And of course, the Karana, um, they decided that they didn't like the British and they must, the British must leave. So they started, they started a war. And they started raiding parties um, down almost as far as, uh, as Calvinia. So a lot of the farmers who, who moved into this, uh, into this area um, had to flee for their lives. Uh, the place became completely deserted again. Uh, the Karana were very, um, they knew the ground very well, they could, they could hide, they could survive in areas that uh, the commandos couldn't. Um, and of course, when they got chased, they just ran back up to the, to the Orange River. Uh, this is a map uh, from slightly later, uh, but it shows all the different groups that um, were living along, along the river. There was you know, at least more than a dozen different, different groups living there. But the ones that were causing most trouble were the other beast Karana, and they were living round about where Kenart is now. So the, the Ulgravis Falls are just off the left-hand side of the screen, and, and the town at the top is Uppington. So you can see roughly where that where that place is. And you know, when they got uh, chased by the by a commando, they would just swim across the river into the bush and hide in the bush and when the commander arrived they'd, they'd shoot at them. Um, I'm, I read that uh, most of the, the commando um, men couldn't swim so they couldn't swim into the island so basically once the Karana were holed up on the island there was nothing much uh, they could do. Um, 
and it was a real problem, you know. And eventually, the only way they could capture the the, the leaders of the um, heart of his Quran was by subterfuge. They invited another pastor, so another uh, Qurana community invited them around, and then one, once they were there, they captured them and handed them over to the British. Um, this is the, the Artbis River, which runs from the Orange all the way down into the colony, and and you know you can hide an army um, in that bush, so it was very difficult to to find them. But eventually they got caught and they were sentenced here to Robin Island, and had to work at uh, breaking rocks and all the other things they had to do. And after some years they were they were let free and they went back to the area, but by that time, uh, those particular uh, leaders of the Hard Beast Karana were, were, were too old to, uh, to do anything. But um, some years later, in 1879, um, the whole area uh, rose up um, in opposition to the British and they had a, another big war. But by this time, um, the British army were involved. With, uh, with cannons and machine guns and things. So it was, uh, again, a, uh, a sorry state. So that's what the book's really about. That whole, that whole story, all the things that happened, the people involved. And the, the last uh, chapter but one is some archaeological work. I'm not an archaeologist, but um, I have lots of friends who are. And I found uh, historical records of, of two farms, uh, Woodnarth Khat and uh, Onkluk's Fontaine, which is, you know, Murderer's Hole and Unlucky Spring. Not auspicious names. Um, but I found lots of records there of, um, of bastards who lived there and then uh, colonists who lived there. And um, from that, we could make a timeline of who, who built what buildings uh, and who was there and, and what they were doing. So that was, um, to me, quite interesting. So the last chapter but one is, is about that research and um, and that's the end. If you're wondering what that is, um, that's, that's another farm that I visited um, and that looks like a crawl but in fact it's actually a, a threshing floor. So that's where you, they, the, the farmer would, would um, get the donkeys to, to trample the grain and then and then they'd winnow the grain so that they could get the um, wheat from the chaff. But if you look at the ground, you know, where do they grow it? I mean, this place is like really the most unforgiving place I've ever been to, I think, as a farm. Um, so I'm going to say goodbye and thank you, Nigel, yeah. for, for all your interesting inputs. Most Much appreciated. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Also, I'll say, to, yeah. Thank you. Nice to speak to you all. Thank you. Cheers. 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 Um, everyone. Click the off button. Bye bye, Nigel. I think Bam and, and, and Phil still wanted to say thank you.